left and moving things to the right. And my brain was dying slowly. And I progressively kind of like, no, you know, no disrespect to the mill. I kind of thought that if I give you an advice today is that you should always, always try to at least once in your life work on a big studio. The reason for that is because while you're in a big studio, and I'm going to, I'm going to go back because this slide is not a good slide to stay there. Um, so I'll <laughs> just put another one. Um, might as well have some cool stuff on the background. Um, so I always advise everyone that I meet, either students or people that are in the industry, to always work on a big company at least once in their lifetime because it is going to really going to be a defining factor for your career because it's going to be the place where you, first of all, meet all your friends. Most of the friends that I work with, I'm still the ones that I met there. And you're going to find your clients as well. Most of my clients today are also the clients that I've met to there. And not to mention, working on a big company like The Mill, like ILM, like MPC, is going to be giving you a pipeline. It's going to give you a methodology. It's going to give you the quality standard that you need to become even better. Because these companies are really high-end. There is no shortcuts. Everything You saw the presentation with Adam just before from ILM. Nothing is a shortcut, you know? Like, everything has to be perfect. And so working on this company allowed me to become perfectionist. And it allowed me to learn pipelines and to understand how it works in a team effort. But... I also, at the same time, advise my students and my colleagues to never stay too long on a big company because it's really soul-crushing because of this, because of commuting, because of clients, because of you basically become dead inside and you feel like this uh, Silent Hill character. So the whole thing with this is that I kind of had to leave. I was working too much. I was working too late, working too many weekends, and developed you know, optical nerve damage because of working too much, did a bunch of MRIs, did eye tests, had to use a, looked like a pirate for a while because of that. I developed like sciatica back problems. You know, it's all my fault because I should have moved more, should have like rested more, but I didn't because I was obsessed by my work. So I, I left a really good position there and I started working from home. Uh, obviously, this was before COVID-19. At the time, working from home was not considered a cool thing. It was considered shit. It was considered, oh, you work from home, oh, we don't want to work with you. Because that was the whole thing. Now, no one cares. But at the time, in 2015, it was a problem. Because most people have a conception of what working from home is. They have a, a kind of a strange like, thought process of what working from home is. So, and. Because, you know, none of this is real. The way I work from home is like this. This is my office with all the equipment that I usually had at the mill. But at the mill, we used to have like a, an editing studio, and then we had a graving studio, and then we had a compositing studio. I merged all three of them in one single room. That's why I used to so many monitors. And also, the other reason I, I... It wasn't just because of the health reasons and also because of... And I really, re and, and like, really tell you all to really be careful with your health. Really rest. Really don't work too hard. Don't work every weekend because it's, it's, you're gonna pay for it when you're 40, like I am now. So just be careful with that and try to rest as much as you can. I think people are better at that now. I th I don't think they were back in the 2000s, and that's why I'm paying for it now. Uh, it's all my fault anyway. So, and but the other reason as well was creative freedom. Working on a big company, you become like a little clog on a machine. You become like a little piece of the, of the puzzle. A lot of people love that. I don't. I'm an artist from trade. You remember, I had a degree in fine arts. So I thought, you know, I'm sure it's possible to work from home. I'm sure you don't need to use FTP, you know, because no one uses FTP anymore. And no one waits for years. So I developed a pipeline. The same way I developed a pipeline at the mill, developed a pipeline to work from home. This was the pipeline I developed in 2015 at the time, using off-the-shelf equipment. It's not the pipeline I'm using now, because now I've don't use, um, I don't use uh, this crap anymore, like the, the Final Cut thing. I now use DaVinci. 
And, and so off the shelf using Dropbox business, using Skype, Nuke Studio, F-Track, you know, all these softwares. And the first project I did remotely was a short film called Lennon Slow Motion, which I supervised on set in LA, and then it was directed uh, by Peter Lavolzi. It starred Martin Starr. You should check it out. It's called Lennon in Slow Motion. It's a really uh, funny short film directed by Peter Lavolzi. It's only seven minutes long. It's on Vimeo. It's on YouTube. You should check it out. It's, it's really fun. It has a lot of visual effects. Then my second project as a, uh, working from home was a project, a very weird project called uh, Baby Teeth, where for some reason everyone started removing their teeth as a fashionable thing. So trying to have baby teeth instead of normal teeth. Don't ask me who came up with this idea. I just did the VFX, didn't do anything else. It's a really strange film, uh, but a really funny film. And eventually I got called by a, a, a client of mine, an old client of mine from the mill, Will, Will O'Connor, which was a client of mine that, I, that used to be at that office where I was at the mill doing commercials. He called me up and said, I'm opening a company called Fire.Smoke. And we are only going to do trailers for games. That's the only thing we're going to do. And I said, sign me up. Where do I sign? And I went. And I went and I became a director for the company. I was there for four years. Um, remember, I was a big gamer. So this, this is my consoles. I have 27 consoles, all hooked up, by the way. They're all connected. So I can play all, all of them at any moment. And gathered my pipeline and started working for cinematics and trailers for a bunch of companies. Uh, it was the same pipeline and we basically, before COVID, we worked all remotely. I had people in Germany, I had like people in London, I had like people in Sweden. We were all calling each other through Zoom. This was years, this was 2017, years ago, years before the pandemic hit. And we had some really successful projects like we, I ended up like directing Just Cause 3 Firestarter, which was a really big hit for, for Square Enix. Um, it was really nice. I love Square Enix. I ended up going to their Japan office to meet them and everything, which was really nice. We ended up like doing, doing this entire CG cinematic for, with three people remotely. Only three people uh, used, did this project. We did it for like two months. Um, entire thing done in uh, Redshift. I switched to Redshift a long time ago. Um, and yeah, we started having a lot of fun, doing a lot of experimentation. Now, because I was directing these things, I could have a lot more creative control. So I ended up like becoming the creative director of these projects. And I, together with the client, together with the game studio, I could develop exactly what they wanted without the middleman, without the agencies, without the other producers that are always on the middle and always making everything a bit more painful. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these breakdowns. They're all on my website. You can go there and watch them. All of them are on my website. All of them are on my YouTube channel. You can go and check them there. Then a pivotal moment was Homefront of Evolution. Unfortunately, a very bad film, a very bad game. But Homefront of Revolution was the first time that I ended up directing a cinematic, an in-game cinematic. When you boot up the game, this is the first thing that shows up. This was the first time I directed something that was live action for a game, which was a really cool thing. We used motion control, and again, using remote pipelines, we had four composters and three. We only had one CG artist and then one Houdini artist on this entire project. Because I'm directing, I'm controlling the entire budget, and I'm producing the project as well. So I tend to like prefer to have longer projects for a longer time than having shorter ones. So then I can actually stay with less people, but for a longer time. And then you get more creative and you get to get, get to do cooler stuff because of that. Uh, that only works really on the video games industry because the video games industry is such a slow paced industry compared to the film industry and to the visual effects industry. So ended up doing mostly these with a lot of matte painting done by David Gibbons. A lot of CG, a lot of redshift visual of, uh, CG rendering, uh, lighting, and of course a lot of composting, a lot of green screen composting as well. These days I would have done it with virtual production, I wouldn't have done it with green screen, but you know, this was 2016. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we actually ended up being the actors of the project themselves, that's why the acting is so bad. So we ended up like doing all these shots uh, in three months. It took us like three months, 
won a bunch of awards with this, which really, really nice for the whole team. We're really happy. Again, I'm going to skip most of this because you've, all of these breakdowns are on my website. They're all on YouTube. And I really want to wrap this up because I want to go for questions. I want you to ask me things. And I don't want to spend time showing you things that you can already see everywhere. Uh, you know, so I'm going to just like, like flip through them. Um, then from there, ended up directing this cinematic for a game that no one knows. It's called Heroes Arena. It was really fun because it was like a kung fu cinematic almost, like very stylized again uh, with a lot of animation, a lot of uh, full CG shots with a lot of uh, really crazy camera angles <laughs> with, because of uh, all the feedback we got. So that was fun. And then we ended up, these are just some of the projects. I ended up doing 15 cinematics as I was at Fire That Smoke. I don't, I'm not going to show you all 15. I ended up doing the crew as well, like a bunch of cinematics for the crew um, in full CG as well. Uh, ended up doing like a bunch of cinematics for uh, Walking Dead, uh, for a bunch of their games as well. Uh, very stylized thing as well. Pretty much like doing, I, I love doing stylized projects. I really like that. that I guess that's from my artistic side really. Um, and then ended up being hired by Ubisoft to do a Mario vs. Rabbids tra trailer. Didn't end up as I planned, so I went there to uh, Paris to direct this thing, brought my own team, we did the entire trailer, it got cancelled, and then they pushed out another trailer with pieces of our trailer, it was a fucking mess. So, you know, it's what it is, it's Ubisoft. So, you know, like, it's, lear like, I learned um, my lesson, uh, but it was cool. It was a cool trailer. There's a few shots that are from our work in, in this trailer. This is the ET trailer, the announcement trailer of the game. This was a really cool project to work because it was Mario, and I really like Super Mario, so I was really happy to do this. Our animators were over the moon. You know, They were so happy that they were animating Mario, and we were getting the rigs from Nintendo themselves. It was so cool that we actually got the rigs from the game, um, which was introduced to the Max, by the way, which was a bit weird. And from there, we ended up like, I ended up directing a game. Oh, my, my laptop is crapping out a bit. Sorry about that. Uh, ended up like directing a, a, a cinematic for Vermintide uh, Warhammer. This was all live action. The whole thing is live action with motion control. Uh, it's all with miniatures from Warhammer, the whole thing, uh, using macro lenses uh, and then smoke machines. There's very little CG. There's a lot of matte painting on the background, but very little CG on this thing. Uh, mostly shot for real with all the, all, all the miniatures and all the, we had to paint them all, of course. <laughs> we had like several people working on this and painting them correctly for Warhammer because they were very specific in how they should be filmed and should be photographed. We had a lot of fun doing that. Um, directed that project. This was 2019. We're getting closer to the end. And then uh, we also had some CG, like there's some Houdini CG here, uh, which is, there's also some modeling. This is actually a real model, uh, a real actual model that we did in wood. And then we put CG on top, explosions, like particles on top of it, integrated. And then some CG rats flying around as well, which we scanned uh, and then used Nuke's 3D system to comp them in again. It was, it was fun. Uh, so this was, was a nice project. Again, I have this on my YouTube channel. You can go and check. On the side, I do a lot of on-set supervising. So last thing I did actually was like a couple of months ago, I supervised, I VFX supervised these commercials for Adobe, which is funny because this was all done in Nuke, but it was for Adobe After Effects. Um, it was a commercial for Adobe After Effects. This is, there's five of them. I only have two here with me. Only two came out, so I only have two. This is one of the last projects I ever did. Um, and then this is another one. I only have two of the five, by the way. So again, motion control and a lot of compositing, a lot of CG, a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and yeah, and then again, going back to what I said about working remotely and working from home, now with the pandemic, it doesn't matter. My clients don't give a crap. They're like, oh, sure, working from home. I'm home right now. So no one cares really anymore. So now that, that was cool because that allowed me to like develop a studio on my house. Um, this doubles up as my studio for my videos on streaming, on Twitch and on YouTube. 
uh, and also allows me to have very advanced equipment for composting, grading, editing, and finishing. Uh, so this is kind of my setup. I know it's a bit dark. You can hardly see it, probably. Um, but that's the whole point. It's to be dark, so you, you can see it. So you don't. So you actually work in. So this is my majority of my time is doing composting, doing rendering, grading, lighting, a bunch of stuff with my um, setup. I have videos about my setup. I don't need to bother you with the technicalities of it. Or you can ask me questions if you want to. Um, I also do some cooking videos with my wife, with Anna. I have a vegan and vegetarian uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, so, you know, uh, most of the equipment that you would find on any studio, really, uh, especially like I use a lot of scopes to do color correction. Uh, I know for most people, scopes are like the matrix. You're like looking at them and like, oh, what the hell is that? But um, I really advise you to start to get hang. If I give you a tip to, to get to know them, there's a really good software called uh, No Omniscope that does these really advanced scopes for color correction, and including they have uh, a f um, uh, you know they have the false color, which is something you can find on cameras, and you can have it on your video output as well, which is really good for you to actually find out exposure and, and definition and grading and and actually overexposed parts of it. This is the Sniper Elite Five with that. And I swear to God, that's not the predator view. It's just like false color, which looks like that almost. Um, I also use it for, for grids to compose images and also, of course, for the audio levels as well. Um, you know, all sorts of things. Of course, all of this together with uh, calibrating everything very thoroughly. I use something called Kalman to calibrate all my monitors. I do that like every... Three months I do that. Uh, that's something we used to do at the mill as well, but obviously I'm alone now. I, I have to do it myself. And I even have like a, a really funny thing. I have a CRT monitor as well, uh, which I use sometimes to broadcast some really awkward formats if I need to. Uh, but there's another reason why a CRT monitor, which is really these big, big, big ass monitors from the 90s, there's another reason why it's so cool. The other reason is because you can play light, ga light games. Um, so this is me playing Virtual Cop with a Sega Saturn light gun, which you can't do on an LCD. You have to use a CRT to play light guns, just like the arcades, so, which is cool. So yeah, so as I said, this, is, this doubles up as my streaming setup and my live studio setup as well. There's no point of you thinking that you need to buy all of this. No, I, I bought all of this because I've been buying it for the last 15 years. This is now 2021 that you're watching on the screen. The last project I, I did was Adobe, but also was the Rebellion project. You saw that last year. I'm not going to bother you with this. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. The YouTube channel of Confetti has the entire presentation. You can watch it there. Uh, that's the presentation I did with his son. And this is the presentation about the Sniper Elite 5 trailer that I directed. And his son's visual effects team did the entire VFX side of it. Uh, I did the editing and I did the grading. Uh, and the, the direction and the directing of the project. I'm going to skip these breakdowns because you've seen them all, or you can watch them on the YouTube channel. And I'm going to move along to wrap up my show by saying, you know, I'm going to shamelessly promote myself. You should definitely go and support my YouTube channel. It's called Hugo's Desk. I really want to get to 100,000 subscribers. I'm only halfway through, uh, but with your help, I can get there. I have also Twitter, two Twitter accounts. I have Hugo Siguera and Hugo's Desk on Twitter. You should definitely check out uh, our visual effects podcast. We have a visual effects podcast called VFX Notes. This is with Ian Files from Before and Afters. It's a magazine, a really good magazine, and a really good website as well. We, are, we have done 42 episodes of our podcast now. It's a visual podcast. It has a lot of breakdowns, a lot of clips as well, where we discuss. And sometimes we have guests. Um, for example, our last guest was Seretti, which is the VFX supervisor of Guardians of the Galaxies. He's going to come back to the show again as well, by the way. As I said, I also have a vegan and vegetarian YouTube channel called Green Recipes for All. Uh, go and support that channel if you like, vegan and vegetarian food. I'm a vegetarian. So I like that. Um, if you're interested, I have a new course as well, if you want to sign up. But to wrap this all up, I guess the question is, 
what have I learned since 1999, which is when I started, uh, you know, 24 years ago. I know the I know the website said 25. It's not 25. It's 24. Sorry. Um, so sorry about that. What have I learned since 99? Absolutely nothing. Like I don't know anything yet. I'm still learning. I'm still today learning Nuke, and I'm still learning the new tools. And I'm as scared as I was from the beginning. Uh, you know. As I am now and as I was 20 years ago, as you are as well, this is a very daunting industry. Um, and you always need to be on top of it. Uh, you need to be agnostic. That's the first advice I give you. Be completely agnostic. Don't care about any software. Care about the techniques, not the softwares. So be software agnostic. Learn about color and composition, lighting and photography. Don't care about the software itself, because that's not going to lead you anywhere. You saw in my presentation, I've used six different compositing applications so far in my career. I can't be, I need to be agnostic, otherwise I'm going to be left behind. Uh, and I'm sure Nuke will be replaced by something else at some point. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's it for the presentation, and we should go to some questions, really. Now, it always works to put some, someone clapping, then you clap. It's psychological. Very good. Um, OK, so let's go for questions. Yeah, so I've got like a roaming mic. I know you guys um, gave me some questions on Google, but hopefully I'm like on Google Forms, but I'm hoping that you say them in real life instead. So does anyone want to put their hand up and I'll come Be over with the mic? Before we do questions, though, oh, yeah, go before we go. do questions, do you guys want to do a selfie with me? Oh, yeah, do a selfie. Let me hide. Are you happy with that? Can we do a selfie? <laughs> Hey, Kiwi. Okay. Okay. Um, I think this one just needs. Oh, thank you. Best work done. Best, best and worst work you've done for the mill. <laughs> well, the best, the best has to be hands on the Call of Duty Ghosts. I, that's the most proud I am at the mill. It's by far the thing that I love the most in terms of style and in terms of achievement that we did back then. This was 2014. That's the best project. Call of Duty Ghosts cinematics. The game is shit, but you know, the cinematics are good. It's worth for that. Um, and the worst, it's a random little commercial with some prices of some toilet paper, you know, like, like some stuff popping up in the screen. That's kind of the worst project I've ever done. But that's, I mean, the worst project I've ever done from a point of view of delivering something that is not good. Now, if you're going to ask me what is the worst project of doing a project, the process of doing a project, there are several of them at the mill that happened to almost kill me while I was there. I'll give you one. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'll just give you the lowdown. Uh, years ago, I wasn't directly involved, but my department was involved, and so I had to take care of it a bit. Years ago, we were doing a commercial for a car, went, they went and shot the whole thing in Italy with a really beautiful car, shot the whole thing. No VFX needed, because the car was there. You know, all practical, as we like it, right? All practical, just like Top Gun, all practical. You know, and then the footage comes around, client looks at it, that's the wrong car, that's not the car. What's that car? And we're like, well, that's the car you showed up on set with. I don't know, like, what are you talking about? Oh, it's another car, this is not the correct car. Short, like, to make the story short, we had to end up, like, the mill had to end up replacing the car in CG on every shot with no data from set because it, there was no one on set because it was a commercial, practical commercial. They replaced the car on every shot, and 
they never mentioned this on any place. So the, that commercial is still to this day considered a grading job that we did at the mill. There's no CG on that job. That was by far one of the worst projects that we had to deal with. That's an example, you know. Cool, thank you. Um, hands up. Questions? Do we just... I'll read one uh, from Patrick, who's just over there. Wave at us, Patrick. Uh, Patrick says, is there a big difference between working on live action and video game content? Well, yeah, it is. Because, well, live action, the problem with live action is that when you're on set, it's a disaster. It's like there's no time for anything. You're rushed on set. Everyone wants to do everything for yesterday. You only have 10 minutes to do an HDR. You only have 10 minutes to light the green screen. There's never any time. Everything always gets badly filmed. Never any time for anything. On a video games project, it's different. Time is different for them because games get delayed all the time. And so when the games get delayed, the trailer gets delayed, and the cinematic gets delayed, and everything else gets delayed. Sometimes it even gets canceled. I've now worked on three cinematics that never came out, you know, so that happens as well because of it, it getting delayed. And I've also worked on stuff that games that never came out, the game itself never came out, including a game that we did at the mill called, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, Rainbow Six Patriots, which is a game that never came out. We did cinematics, we did marketing material, we did posters, we did all sorts of things for it. That game never came out. So that's all dead work, like, you know, so yeah. So it's, it's a different type of work, really, yeah. On that, um, is it really frustrating when it doesn't come out? Like, you put all this work in and it never comes, or do you It's know? super frustrating. I remember, like, there was this... I, I didn't work on that job, but my, my department did. There was a, this really famous uh, uh, commercial from... I think it was from Nike or Adidas, I can remember. It was with Messi. This was Messi just at the moment that he was leaving a, a club to move to another club. And so, unfortunately, the whole commercial, which had a lot of CG, had the jersey of one club, and then he moved to another club. And so they had to cancel the commercial because he had the wrong jersey for the whole commercial. He had the wrong club. We still considered doing a CG replacement of his shirt, but then, but then what happened was they actually said, yes, that's a good idea. But then this, this was a commercial for a sneaker, and then the sneaker sold out before the commercial came out. And so we're like, oh, fuck it. We're not even going to release the commercial anymore because it's sold out. We can't even sell the sneakers anymore. So that commercial never came out. So that happens a lot. Like, there's a lot of work. I have friends of mine that have, that have worked on entire sequences of animation films that have never come out. They've been cutted on the editing bay. You know, so entire characters from Pixar movies that have been removed from a film. And so a person has worked for like a year on that character and then that character doesn't show up the cut. And they only find out when they get to the cinema. Like they go to the cinema to watch the movie and then it's not there. It's really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say as well, like you were mentioning earlier about the burnout and how hard you work for these companies. Does that mean you can't use any of the stuff you've made if they haven't released it? No, if it's not released, you can't show it. In fact, even if it's released, you still have to ask permission anyway. Sure. So it's, it's really tricky. Um, you get into a lot of trouble if you show it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't show it. Interesting. Um, so I think you guys got some questions. I've got yours written here if you want to read it. Yeah, of course you can. Um, I've been watching a few of your YouTube videos for help with my dissertation on deep compositing. Um, and I was wondering if you could share any insights into how uh, deep images could be used alongside uh, depth in the VFX pipeline and whether or not it's you can merge the two. Yeah. So deep, deep uh, compositing is definitely my favorite way of doing compositing by far, although I know... A lot of people don't like it because it's very heavy and it takes a lot of space and bandwidth. I still think it's the most optimal way of compositing. And in fact, most of the big studios are using Deep right now. Uh, you know, Obviously, it kind of kicked off on Veta. That was the first place that really started using Deep in a really, really big way. And now all the studios are doing Deep. Now, answering your question about depth maps and Deep altogether, it's funnily enough, you should check out some of the breakdowns and some of the, the materials and articles that are coming out now with Avatar 2, where they actually have 
a very similar, you remember the Kinect years ago from Xbox 360, which had like a two lens system to do deep deep data, like depth data. And so they, they have a more advanced version, of course, of this. So they attach it to the, to, the, to the stereo rig of the cameras, uh, because it's still shot in stereo avatar. And so what they've done is they managed to output a very good deep map to actually have occlusion in real time when they're shooting in, in virtual production. So now they can have the CG characters behind and in front of other characters. So there's a lot of developments happening from VETA on that front. They've published some papers on SeaGraph for that. I'm sure, like always, when VETA publishes stuff and they make these things available, then it, it starts to become mainstream everywhere else. So they've always been very open. They're a really good company for that. So I'm, I'm assuming that at some point we'll get more data like that. There's already some of that in Nuke. Like you have some really good copycat uh, uh, setups to do depth data based on one image. If you have two images, it's even better if you have a stereo rig. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting because I, I think that's going to really revolutionize the way we composite, really, to be honest. That method that they've come up with at Avatar 2, if you watch some of the, I, I've, unfortunately, some of the breakdowns I've seen are not public. They're at the Visual Effects Society Awards uh, ceremony only. But I've seen some incredible stuff where they actually managed to get uh, deep maps from water, you know, like even water ripples and stuff were getting captured by this thing. So it's just a matter, because the, what they did was they, they did it so smartly. It's not just trying to capture the, the, the depth data. It actually has a, a machine learning system where they feed into the system the entire scan of the rooms, and they also feed the, all the scans of every actor. And so both the scans of the actors and the scans of the rooms and the scans of the props are fed into the system. So when the system is trying to calculate the deep map, it already kind of tries to understand with all those scans what objects are what. And then it tries to make pretty much pixel accurate occlusion on deep, which is like really revolutionary. And I think that's the methodology really to go for. You can't just rely on one image. You need to have the image as a base. And then you need to, ha no, need to have your entire machine learning system with all the data from that set and all the scans to help the system to triangulate the, de the, the, the depth map. You know? So yeah, it's really, really fascinating stuff that they're doing there at VETA. Yeah. So without, without having that extra data um, taken from set, it would be quite difficult to merge deep renders it with, would. with plate footage. Yeah, the, well, the old-fashioned way is to just make what you can with the technology you have right now. You get a lot of artifacts, a lot of edge problems, then you need to clean up those edges, and you need to like make, the, like you basically use roto, use paint, use all sorts of systems. But those things are quickly changing with with machine learning like they're really changing quite rapidly so i don't think we will wait too long for having a good system I, i'm pretty sure i'm not sure you know i don't know but i'm pretty sure you know foundry is already working on something like that uh, to implement into nuke i'm sure you know if they're not they should you know so otherwise they're going to be left behind thanks very much yeah no problem um, so my question is, have you worked on any productions that are utilizing USD? Has it affected end-to-end -end production? How does it affect end-to-end -end production as a compositor? And does the introduction of USD for Nuke interest you? Yeah, so the only project we used in the entire implementation of USD was the Sniper Elite 5 trailer. Rebellion has an entire pipeline dealt with the USD. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing to handle the entire proxy system and all the geometry into Nuke and then, of course, the, the, all the caching between Houdini and between, uh, in between Redshift. It, yeah, I can't... can't uh, it's, it's really good. The only downside we had at the time was that we couldn't do depth with it yet. I'm, I'm not sure if you can do that now, but at the time we couldn't do very easily all the depth information, so we ended up compositing that trailer with regular 2D renders. But you know, most of the shots were shot in one layer, and then we only split certain layers that were really needed for depth of field. So we ended up like merging, 
normally I separate quite a lot of layers, but this time we didn't. We didn't separate a lot. Uh, because we, what we did was we rendered all in one go, and then we tried where we needed, we separated stuff, you know. So, and then of course with crypto uh, masks and some, you know, tweaks and hacks here and there, we managed to fix the rest, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Cool, Josh, yours is next. Josh Farthing is over there. Wave it, Hugo. I'll ask it, but it's from him over there in the red. Yep. <laughs> um, how was how has the emergence of VP and game engines impacted your workflow, and has it improved the production process? For example, made it more enjoyable or not? So, when you're talking about virtual production, you're talking about like real, like just the real time on engines and rendering, or you're actually talking about the set side of it. You're talking all of it. Yeah, it really changed the way we work. Like when I left the mill, we were just using Arnold at the time. Then I switched to Redshift, which was a bit faster because it was GPU accelerated. But then when I went to Ubisoft to work on the Mario versus Rabbits project, we used the in-house engine, which was called Snowdrop, which is the engine that now they use in the majority of their games, including the Division, Division 2. And that engine basically could output AUV systems, very rudimentary AUVs, in real time. Uh, in EXR from the engine itself. That was the first moment that I was like, oh my God, this changes everything. Because this was before Unreal. This was like in-house engines that they were operating. The funny thing back then, this was 2015, the engineers at Ubisoft, they were so uh, so sad and so upset because it was so slow. You know, Because they were so used to 60 frames per second. They were like, their engine has to hit 60. And we were getting a huge bottleneck because we were rendering AUVs, very rudimentary AUVs. We were just having uh, ambient occlusion. We were having reflections. We had like some crypto matting. It was like five or six AUVs that we were managing to output from the system. The system wasn't managed to do that, so we had to make it up. We had to program it. And they were really pissed off because they couldn't hit 60 frames per second with the XRs because the, as the AUVs came out, it was seven AUVs, so to render and, and save the EXRs was taking too long on the hard drive. Even a fast hard drive was a bottleneck. So they were doing it at two frames per second or three frames per second. So they were so sad. They were like, I'm so sorry, Hugo. We can't make it any faster. It can only be three frames per second. And we were like, it's amazing. Three frames per second is amazing. I'm used to 45 minutes per frame. So it's like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. So we ended up like rendering the entire trailer every night. You know, like the, the trailer was like three minutes long, and every night we would just render the whole thing. Uh, and then the next day, compositing would come in, and we could comp. It was taking longer to comp and nuke than actually rendering it from the engine. So, so that really changed my way of working forever. And, and now, of course, with other engines now doing the same, and now you have nukes bridge with Unreal, and you can get some AUVs from Unreal. It kind of like, it's starting to really get there. Uh, it's starting to be a point where certain projects, you can actually use that as an engine, as an effective engine, you know. Not all projects, but a lot of projects we do, now we can use it, because uh, it has en enough quality. Now, in terms of virtual production on set itself, I have never done that, uh, so I don't have any experience with that whatsoever. Um, uh, you should go to the next talk, which is with Yisan. He, he has all the experience in the world about that. So you should check his talk. I've never shot with uh, VP. I'm not that interested. I like to be outside. I like to be with a camera out, outdoors, film real stuff. I, I'm not so sure. I've been on, on VP sets. I never shot anything, but I, it's not really for me. It's not the kind of place that I enjoy working, but that's just me personally as a director. I don't really, um, you know, don't connect yet. I'm sure I'll change my mind when I try it, I'm sure. But for now, I haven't had that chance yet, you know. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, Matt, who I just saw, Matt is, give us a wave, Matt. Where are you? Matt G. I saw you, where are you? Oh, yeah, over there at the back. Okay, so Matt asks, what are your thoughts on AI? Um, artificial intelligence-driven toolkits. Are jobs in danger, or are there limitations? Wow, that's a, how long do you have? Like, <laughs> <laughs> is that a panel that we're going to do? I think I it's mean, a dissertation question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
obviously, like this is a loaded question. I in the and and it became even more loaded with a few days ago. Corridor Digital launched that video that they made with um, with uh, pretty much a Castlevania manga that they did pretty much in, in using the help of AI. It's it's complicated. I don't think our, our jobs are in danger. I think people need to use it and they need to learn these tools because they're going to change the way you work for sure. Everyone in this room should be really paying attention and they should really try to experiment with machine learning driven data inside of Nuke or inside of any other software that you use. Should really start looking into it. Flame also has a lot of that as well. And right now, there's a lot of tools doing really incredible work. As if it for it replacing it, I'm not entirely sure that's really going to be like that. I, I'm maybe I'm wrong. You know, I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times, and I kind of see it as a technology-driven thing that will help our work and it will help us being more efficient and work even with more projects at the same time. I don't see it replacing because we've been here so many other times. You know, like. Also, years ago, when the digital camera came along, we thought, oh, photography is dead. No one will ever do photography ever again. And we still do photography. So it's, it's like technology comes around. People get really uh, upset, and they get really panicky. But I think you should just calm down. <coughs> no one should really get into panic mode. You should just be uh, uh, um, looking into it and <coughs> checking all the, the tools that exist right, right now and experiment with them. Having said this, there is a huge problem in the horizon. And this happened, like last year, I was at the, View, at the View conference. And we did a panel. Like They did a panel about AI. And the, categorically, the biggest problem that was presenting into the panel was the, legal, the legality of all of this, You know, using the models from other people, the art from other people. Definitely, that's where everything will stop, really. I think once the legal teams come in, I think we're gonna this this type of AI models will really change, and it will be more about you driving the data into the model by yourself using your own data to drive the AI than than stealing data from the internet, because that has a lot of legal ramifications. Not to mention, right now, most of the legal most of the AI-driven art that you can do. You can't even copyright it. You can't sell it. It's still ho owned by the company that is doing the AI. So I really think that there is a lot of dust in the air. It needs to settle. We need to kind of understand what's going on. I think AI is one thing, of course. Then machine learning is a different thing. Machine learning is already alive and well on most companies. And most companies are taking advantage of it already for most of their rendering pipelines, most of their modeling pipelines. So that you should really look into. So I think, think that's my answer. This is a really big topic. It takes a long time to discuss. But you should definitely ask everyone that you see on festivals and just get the feel for the room and then investigate further. And, can, and this is for everyone in this room here. Because it is going to shift and change our industry forever. I don't believe completely it will replace jobs, because it will just create new jobs and it will create new opportunities. And I think we'll just adapt to that. I, I feel like that's where really we're going to head, uh, really. Because if it does replace the jobs, if it is as grim as some people think, then keep in mind that it's not just going to be our jobs. It's going to be all jobs. So then it's a bigger problem, because you then have the same problem in medicine. You have the same problem in lawyers. You have the same problem. All other industries will be affected by the exact same issue as the replacement of jobs. And obviously, we can't all be unemployed because that's not going to work mm -hmm. out. So it's it's there's definitely you need to be at, uh, you need to really look into it, but you need to also not panic yet, at least I guess <laughs> not yet. Thank you. Um, I think we're just going to take a quick photo so Tom can head off to the next talk. So just, sorry, photo Hi. break with Tom. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to look at the next question. Leo, yours is next. Hi. Leo, do you want to, while you're doing that, Leo, do you want to ask it with a mic? Yeah, no? Okay. Mic. So, sorry, a bit random, but got to go. I'm going to prep you for the next question, Hugo. So the next one, after your photo, no, it's all good. Sorry, my fault. Um, I didn't want you to miss out on the uh, press shots, hey? Uh, so, Thank Hugo. You so thanks, Tom. Have you seen any use of VR or AR in the production of assets or shots? 
Sorry, v have you seen any use of VR or AR in the production of assets or shots? Yeah, we definitely. I've used VR on production of assets right already. Uh, even on even as back as back as Homefront, we were actually looking at the CG models that we had through a v VR headset. Uh, at the time, it was the Oculus, the first Oculus, which was really a crappy headset, really. But yeah, we 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 use it for visualization and for. I use it sometimes for staging and for actually angle looking, and I use it a lot. And it's it's pretty cool if you get used to it. If you have a good headset, it's not very hard to to connect it to. Even Nuke can work with it as well uh, if you have the correct drivers. It takes a while to set it up, but it's pretty cool. Um, I definitely would recommend it. AR I've never used in production. No, I've never used that. Uh, but you know, I'm sure it will at some point. Cool. Alex gonna ask his. Is the VFX industry currently looking into some new technologies for creating digital environments? And how would you approach it in your team? Would you base it on Unreal Engine workflow, standard VFX pipeline, or some new exciting technologies? At the moment, I mean, it's hard to say. All companies, of course, have their different pipelines. I, on the companies that I've worked for, we use a mix of both. You know, we have some of it, which is offline rendering, some of it is real-time rendering. Sometimes we have assets which are on the background, might be in, in Unreal. Foreground assets might be in Redshift or in Arnold. And some assets might just be a 3D system in Nuke. You know, uh, some parts of it might be Mantra. There's a lot of mix in ba mixed bag in this thing. You know, it's, I, I, I think that there's no really correct answer for this. I think it, it goes back to what I was saying on the on the talk. Being agnostic is quite good because even for a company, not depending on one single software, this is a team effort. Uh, and of course, some people might be more flexible or more creative on certain softwares than other people. And some people have more practice on some softwares, some softwares than others. I, I, I really think that it will continue to be a mix of multiple softwares. There won't be, I don't, I don't believe, maybe I'll be wrong again, I'm sure, I, I'll be, I've been wrong many times. Um, maybe one day there will be one software that does everything, but I, at the moment I don't see Unreal being that. Unreal is lacking a lot of things, and they are lacking a lot of tools for footage, a lot of tools for, for stock, and to be honest, like, they are very good, but they're not there yet. And I don't think they will be because there will always be other softwares that maybe will do it better, you know. So I think bridging them together will be the trick, really. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so no no name with this one, but I'm sure everyone... Uh -oh. Yeah, I know. It's dodgy. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a scary <laughs> question, then. I'm sure everyone, no name. In here, everyone wants to know this, though. I think. Well, not everyone, but it's a common question. So should I focus on being a specialist or generalist at the beginning of my career? Oh, my God, that question again. <laughs> See? Um, okay. So this really depends on what type of artist you are. Like, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, it depends on what type of thing you like. And I know you probably are thinking, oh, but I don't know what I like. Okay, well, then you need to find that out. Because, you know, if you're a generalist, you're probably going to be driving more into projects that are a bit more to the commercial side. And you're probably going to be driving yourself into more to cinematics and commercials and TV spots and music videos and things that have different aspects all the time. And sometimes if you're very specialized, then you become much more connected to a traditional film pipeline. You know, this is, a, this is really, it goes down into the root of what type of artist you are. For example, I, I don't like to be specialized. I know a lot of people think of me as a specialist in Nuke, but I know a lot of softwares and I use a lot of things. Obviously, I'm more known for using Nuke, but that's just because that was what happened for some reason. But I'm, I'm pretty much a generalist. I've always been a generalist. Um, I like to be on set. I like to film. I like to photograph. I like to do composting. I like to, to shoot stuff. Like I, and I like the fast turnaround of a quick project, like a commercial or like a TV show or like a cinematic. 
I don't really enjoy the slow process of working for very long and being so granular, but that's just me, the type of artist that I am. So you need to think to yourself, whoever you are, because we didn't know how to name, you need to think into yourself, what type of artist am I? Do I like to go really deep into one specific thing? Or do I like to know a lot of different things in one go? It really depends on what you enjoy as an artist. Some people love to just sculpt. Some people love to just animate. Some people love to just, just do roto. And other people love to put their hands on everything. A bit like me, I like to put my hands on everything. And obviously, didn't mean to sound bad. Uh, obviously, I'm not a master of any of them, but I'm good enough for some of them, you know, like, but you could become a master of one of them if you want to. Uh, so, it, yeah, again, it really depends on what type of artist you want to become. And I guess it also depends on what type of company you want to work for, you know, because if you really want to work for film, if, you, if your dream is like, okay, I want to work at ILM or I want to work at DNEG, you are probably going to want to consider a specialization. You can obviously get in as a generalist, but you're probably going to want to consider becoming very specialized in one or two things. But if your dream is working at the mill or working at Nexus or working at, you know, at Blur, if your dream is working on companies that have a different type of pipeline, then maybe a generalist will be a better place for you. So it also depends where you see yourself in the future and what type of company you want to work for, you know. So yeah, yeah. That, was a, that was a really, really good response. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. Whoever you were. Yeah, who, yeah. whoever you are. Yeah. Uh, another anonymous one. <laughs> Oh uh, so maybe. afraid, so much fear. <laughs> it's okay. Last one though. So of all of all the actors and celebrities you've been on set with, have have any ever shown you a keen interest in your role, or do you just get no interaction? Oh, uh, several of them. Several of them had a lot of interaction. I'll never forget. I was on set doing that BBC God Only Knows project that you guys saw, and Brian May, the the guitarist of Queen. He is so into cameras, into technical stuff. He's so into it. He's like always going around with some stereoscopic photo cameras and some weird, very niche cameras that no one knows what they are. You know, like, oh, there's only a hundred of these cameras in the world. He's like, he's very, very into his niche cameras. And when we were shooting, we were using a green screen and then we had some, some we were shooting some assets as well in black and on white. And most of the other, uh, most of the other uh, singers and, and band members, they just left. They just like did their thing for five minutes, get the fuck out of there, they went somewhere else. Brian May stayed there the whole time. He was like watching what we were doing. He was like checking it out. Oh, what are you guys doing now? Asking you stuff. So sometimes you get people like that that are really curious. Maybe he had nothing to do, I don't know. Like he was really curious about everything. Uh, we also get the opposite, you know. We, I had like famous people on set that really, really didn't want to be there, and you know that they didn't want to be there, because they just came in, did their thing, and just left a minute later, you know, so it didn't even talk with anyone. Um, so, uh, so some people are very approachable, some people are not approachable. You know, as a rule of thumb, you never really approach people, like, you just don't want to do that, you don't want to, like, jeopardize the production anyway, so you just approach people if you get approached by them, really. That's the whole rule that we have usually on set, but yeah. Have you um, fangirled at anyone? What? Have you, have you been really like, oh my God, it's them, and, and like freaked out? I did, but only inside. I don't show it. You know, <laughs> you I don't want to. Don't want to be like. I don't want to make also the awkward moment. No, I have. I have. I had moments like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here, or I, I can't believe I'm next to this person. Uh -huh. But I, I couldn't really like. I had to be cool, and I had to like do my job. I'm professional. I'm I'm here. I'm not gonna say anything and I regret that. it. The other, <laughs> like the next day, regret oh, I could have get an autograph. But could've I was specifically selfie. told by production not to ask for an autograph. <laughs> it's on the call sheet. Do not ask for autographs. Okay. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, no, I get that. We were um, <laughs> every year we go to like a music festival called Splendor in Nottingham, and um, I totally ignored all the rules and asked for a selfie with example because I'm a loser. Anyway, guys, um, can we thank Hugo with a round of applause? Thank you so much, Hugo. Thank you so much.
It's, um, oh, ne not next time. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. So, yeah, guys, you've got another talk now with He Sun in Confetti X. Do you know where that is? Go outside, <laughs> come back in again. No, so, <laughs> I don't know where it so, is. So, yeah, go outside, head all the way down the side of the building, and you'll see Confetti X on the end. Thank you so much.